Hello, my name is Albert Garcia and I'm a librarian with the Contra Costa County Library. I'm very happy to be partnering all week with 350 Contra Costa. We have three programs scheduled this week. In addition to, today, to today's program, we also have a program on Wednesday, October 25th at 12 p.m. That is Climate Change Solutions and Advocacy. On Thursday, October 26th, also at 12 p.m., we're hosting What is a Carbon Sink? All three of these programs will be recorded and posted to the library's YouTube channel. Everybody who registers for this program or all three of these programs will get an email with those links next week. Uh, to, you'll see that as you've been um, entering into today's meeting, you will be on mute and your cameras are off. Uh, feel free to turn your camera on, but we do ask you to mute uh, until the Q&A later in the session. Uh, if you look in the chat, uh, the panelists have dropped a survey link. This is a survey monkey link uh, asking you questions about how climate change has affected your life. It's a short uh, one to two minute survey. And if you enter your email address in that survey, you will be entered into a drawing uh, to win a free t-shirt. That drawing will take place at the end of the week. Uh, one last note, uh, in your top right-hand corner, you will see an option for your grid view or speaker view. We're going to be spotlighting our uh, panelists today. So to make sure you get the right view, you'll want to select speaker view. Uh, after the presentation, we will take off the spotlight and you can go back to the grid view if you'd like. Uh, okay, um, uh, in just a minute, I'm going to hand it over to our partners here at 350 Contra Costa. But before that, I do want to talk a little bit about library services. The Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with our resources, services, and materials at all 26 of our branches. Access more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections, and thousands of digital materials 24-7 at CCC. LIB.org. Visit any library to use our public computers, printers, and free Wi-Fi. You can also visit one of our branches with laptops for on-site use or check out a Wi-Fi hotspot for three weeks. Contra Costa County Library's adult literacy program trains and supports volunteer tutors to deliver basic literacy instruction to adults throughout the county. Visit our website and sign up for a digital library card today. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to our panelists, uh, Brenna, and thank you very much and enjoy the program. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Great. Um, thanks everyone for joining our Lunch and Learn webinar series for Contra Costa Sustainability Week. I understand that many of you are joining us for your lunch break, so we're gonna get started right away. My name is Brenna Shafazada, and I volunteer with 350 Contra Costa, who's co-hosting this event with the Contra Costa Library. And I'm joined by Cooper Marcus from Quit Carbon, who will also be presenting today. And we would really like to know how all of you heard about this webinar. So if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, that would really help us out. As we go through our presentations, please feel free to put any of your questions in the chat and we'll go over them at the end. So 350 has a series of events planned for this week, and today we're kicking it off with building electrification. Building electrification offers increased health, vastly improved efficiency, think savings, and overall more sustainable sources of energy, which is really important because we are part of an ecosystem. Here's the blue moon photo of Earth from NASA's Apollo 17 mission taken in December of 1972. This is the first picture of the Earth fully illuminated that any of us ever saw, and it was taken on the last of the Apollo missions. It changed the way that humanity thought about our planet as it highlighted our common home and connection, and the image became a symbol of the environmental movement early on. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the seventh generation principle, which is based on an ancient philosophy of the indigenous Iroquois tribe who are recognized as having the oldest democracy in the world and believed to have provided a model of the American constitution. The seventh generation philosophy states that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. But this principle wasn't really recognized by early American settlers who began burning fossil fuels about seven generations ago. While there are a number of sources of global warming pollution, the largest source is the burning of fossil fuels. And you can see how after World War II and the industrial age and the rise of gas powered transportation, we've had a huge boom in the use of fossil fuels. 
When we overlay that period with the global surface temperature of our planet, you can see that there's a strong correlation resulting from the increased trapped pollution in the atmosphere and dramatically rising global temperatures. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPC, See, just came out with a report in August of 2021 saying it's unequivocal, the science is clear that human activities are warming up the planet. So unfortunately, when you burn gas in your home, you're releasing dangerous toxins, the main one being nitrogen dioxide, second is carbon monoxide, and the third is formaldehyde, one of the leading causes of childhood leukemia. All three of these pollutants are released from the burning of natural gas. What you see on the screen is some data and findings from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, who did a study looking at 60,000 homes in Southern California in 2014. They looked at the types of pollution coming from burning gas for cooking, and they found that in half of those homes, within just two minutes of the stoves being on, the one hour allowable limit of federal air regulations were being reached by these pollutants. And within two minutes, the one hour legal limit was being exceeded by nitrogen oxides and CO. The authors of the article said that if we found th these sorts of limits outside, we'd be able to go back to the source and have regulatory proceedings against them to try to reduce it. But because this is in people's kitchens, there are no regulations and there's nothing that we can do about it. The problem is worse in older homes and homes with smaller spaces where it's difficult to disperse the pollutants. That's generally where we find lower income members of our community in older housing without ventilation and, and smaller spaces. Seven generations ago, when our predecessors started burning fossil fuels, they didn't understand that fossil fuels and the extractive economy would be so catastrophic. But now that we know, we need to make changes to ensure that our planet is a healthy environment for the next seven generations. So in 2018, California passed a law called SB 100, which requires 100% of our electricity to come from clean energy sources by 2045. We were the second state in the US after Hawaii to do this, and California is well on its way to achieving this goal. Today, we have a lot of work to do in order to realign our systems to work in better stewardship of our planet and nature. Issues such as clean transportation, circular economics, regenerative agriculture, nature-based solutions, all hot topics. But today, we're going to focus on clean energy and building electrification because buildings represent the second highest source of emissions. Transportation is number one, but we're focusing on buildings because now, more than ever before, it's truly possible to decarbonize our homes and our buildings. In the last few years, our grid in California has become much, much cleaner, so that there's no longer any question. It's cleaner to go electric, and technologies such as solar panels and heat pumps have at the same time become even more efficient and more affordable. And this is where we have some really good news. This is a chart showing that we don't actually have to burn fossil fuels to provide us with the energy that we need. The deployment of solar around the world has had such a steep adoption curve, and this is continuing to accelerate. At the same time, the cost of solar has come down very fast, faster than anyone ever predicted. And the implications of the lower, of the lower costs are astonishing. Back in 2014, nine years ago, electricity from solar and wind was cheaper than electricity from fossil fuels in only 1% of the world. Five years later in 2019, it was cheaper in two thirds of the world. And next year in 2024, it's expected that solar and wind will provide the cheapest electricity in the entire world. That's tremendous progress made by the solar and wind industry and cutting costs in the last 10 years. This means an all electric home can be more efficient, cleaner, cleaner, healthier, and totally possible. Here we see some common fossil fuel appliances being replaced with more electric ones. So if we don't use gas, what do we use? It turns out that each gas appliance has a very cost effective solution to replace it. Air sort heat pumps shown in the upper left of the screen can act as both your heat and your AC unit. Heat pump water heaters are 300 to 400% more efficient than their gas counterparts. 
And there are even electric fireplaces that can replace your gas insert and they can be very attractive. And there are magnetic electric induction cooktops that are also very advanced. The good news is that all of these have high efficiency, clean electric solutions. Let's look at a heat pump in a little bit more detail. So the same technology that exists in the heat pump, it's the same as what's currently in your refrigerator. The key to its efficiency is that the energy is used to transfer heat rather than to generate heat. So just like your refrigerator transfers heat from the inside to the outside, a heat pump can transfer heat from the inside of your home to the outside and work as an air conditioner in the summer. Or it can transfer heat from the outside to the inside, like in the wintertime. And looking at induction cooking, long gone are the electric resistance cooktops. The newer induction cooktops operate using a magnetic field to heat up a pan, giving the user superior power and control when cooking. 90% of the energy is, is, that's generated is transferred directly to the food that you're cooking. Compare this with gas cooking, where about 30% of the energy is transferred. So a lot of it is just there warming up your kitchen. So it's possible to decarbonize our homes and our buildings today by going all electric, and moreover, it's probable. As the grid has gotten cleaner, as technology has improved, and as costs have come down, we're now seeing signals all over the place that the future is already here. So the five major signals that I'm going to share with you today are coming from the California Energy Commission, PG&E, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, or BACMED, the many jurisdictions who are passing local ordinances to get their towns up to speed, and lastly, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. So let's start with the California Energy Commission, who regulates our state building codes in relation to energy use and efficiency. Their codes are updated every few years, and current code already encourages electrification, strongly encourages electrification in new buildings. And this is expected to get tighter and in the near future to even begin looking at existing building stock. The second, the second uh, signal is coming from our utility building, our utility company, PG&E. So in February of 2021, Hannah Kay and Kelly Cunningham from PG&E delivered a presentation that explained PG&E's support for electrification. And you can watch a recording of this webinar on YouTube. Um, you just look up the title that's shown here on the screen, Electrification, a Balancing Act. It's a really informative webinar and it's worth watching, but I'm going to give you just a, a synopsis. So the first thing is that PG&E has a lot of outdated equipment, which they acknowledge, and it's become an expensive and dangerous liability. Two, because they see the momentum towards electrification and see it as, as the future, they're focusing the majority of their resources on upgrading and strengthening the grid and not the gas lines, which they also acknowledge are leaky. And three, they support local communities and other entities working towards electrification and will collaborate with them. And four, they're incentivizing customers to electrify. So while PG&E has a number of incentives to encourage ratepayers to electrify, one disincentive is the rising gas costs. Both gas and electric rates have gone up like crazy. But gas rates far outpace electric, and according to PG&E, will continue to do so at a faster and faster pace as customers go all electric. A third major push towards electrification comes from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, or BACMED. BACMED covers nine counties, including Contra Costa. Just this past spring, they passed a ruling that bans the sale of gas water heaters starting in 2026 and gas HVAC systems starting in 2029. And this is a big, big deal because it affects not just new buildings, but time of replacement installations as well in existing buildings. So in other words, everyone in the BACMED area, including Contra Costa, is affected. So we talk about climate, efficiency, savings, and or improved health as big intrinsic motivating factors in our, for electrifying our homes. But the intrinsic factors that I just mentioned that are coming from the building codes and PG&E and BACMED 
are also a huge factor. And they're some of the biggest reasons for us to encourage our community to electrify because we can ease the change for our friends and neighbors by helping them to prepare. Because if it's 2028 and your gas water heater clunks out, you could be days or weeks without hot water while you figure out how to make the switch. But if you do this in advance, or at least do the prep work in advance, you're going to be without hot water for just a few hours. Same as if you were switching out for another gas water heater. But if you do it now, you're able to save money because there are a lot of great incentives available. So with this in mind, California cities and counties are also a part of this great momentum. 76 cities in California have adopted a local electrification ordinance to better prepare their communities for the future. And um, I mean, look at the concentration in the Bay Area. That's it's a lot, but it's also happening outside of California as well. And last but not least, the Inflation Reduction Act passed in August of 2022 adds even more momentum towards electrification by making it easier for everyday Americans to participate. The news media has made it clear it's the biggest and best climate law ever passed by any country in all of history. This act allocates almost $370 billion, according to official estimates, to climate solutions and energy security, but it comes largely in the form of tax credits that don't have a limit on how many of them can be activated. This law, when combined with existing policy, will enable the U.S. to sharply reduce global warming pollution by 40% or, or more below the 2005 levels, and that's getting close to the commitments we made as part of the Paris Agreement. It also has incredible economic benefits. It saves money for American households up to 1,800 per year on average. It creates more than 9 million good new jobs. We've seen for a long time now how the investments in clean energy and emissions reductions create many more jobs than continuing to throw money into the dirty, poisonous, polluting fossil fuel economy. And it reduces energy bills and energy expenditures for the entire country at least by 4%. And it means that there are some incredible incentives out there for us to electrify our own buildings. We can have comfortable homes using cleaner and more efficient appliances and save money doing it. There are many resources out there to help us with this transition. In fact, our next speaker is from Quick Carbon, one of the best resources available. And I'll list some others at the end of this presentation. But I like to start with Switches On because you can go to their website, punch in your zip code, and get a list of incentives that are applicable to you based on your location. This includes IRA incentives, as well as any incentives from the state or PG&E, sometimes more. And many times you can stack these incentives and significantly bring down the cost of your project. We got rid of gas in our home and shut off the gas line entirely so that we don't have to pay the delivery charge for a fuel that we no longer use. We also manage local rental properties, my husband and I, and we're working on decarbonizing them as well. Each property can be a really different experience. So now that we've looked at the momentum for electrification, let's look at some of the challenges and also address some of the common concerns regarding electrification. The first challenge for many of us is the learning curve. And in this case, it's not just us, but lots of contractors are having to learn about this technology very quickly. The old rule is to get at least three quotes, but since this is a transitionary time period, I like to bring in around five. In my experience, a contractor might tell me that I need to stick with gas when he or she isn't really familiar with heat pump technology, or they'll say that heat pumps are too new. Sometimes I've even heard that they're too old. They'll say that they don't work as well. No one is going to tell you that they're just not familiar with how to install it. Or maybe they do have experience, but they're still pretty new. And each home is different. So if, if it has a different situation, um, then, then a contractor who is newer to the technology might not be as good at troubleshooting. So the more knowledgeable, experienced contractor is going to know how to help me transition at the best price. If you're looking for a contractor that's more familiar with clean energy systems, start with Bayren or Switches On or with Quick Carbon, who can give you a list of local contractors who have the necessary training. And you can find 
all the great tax incentives and rebates too. So that brings us to challenge number two, affordability. And this area gets a little trickier. I've heard some wild estimates that have made people weary about electrification. You know, sometimes if your first bid sounds really crazy, people just stop looking. But rest assured, the cost can usually be, be brought down significantly. And over time, you should actually be saving money. So here's how to bring the cost down. One, again, get more bids. Um, and, and remember that the, the contractors with the least experience often give the most outrageous quotes. So get, get more, more bids. Um, two, look for incentives. Go to Switches On to find all the incentives that are available. There are a lot of great incentives available through the IRA and the state. And three, after the work is complete, you have to remember to notify PG&E. They can increase your tier one allotment to help you save any more to save even more. So if you call them and say, hey, I've, I've electrified, they give you a different rate plan and that will help you save. And lastly, efficiency matters. So these, these appliances are so much more efficient. I mentioned earlier that heat pumps, water heater, heat pump water heaters are three to 400% more efficient than their gas counterparts. So that will save you more over time as well. The third challenge is the home idiosyncrasies. Not every home is the same. Not every solution is universal. Some homes are more challenging to update than others. For example, a regular heat pump water heater might cause dampness issues. If you try to put it where, where your current water heater is, if it's in a, uh, say, an indoor closet with, with a carpeted floor or something. We personally have not had that issue, but we did have a challenge when trying to switch to an induction cooktop because our counter was cut out for a big protruding gas range. And it took us a while to find a cooktop that would allow us to make the switch without having to remodel our entire kitchen. Luckily, we found it much, much easier to switch to induction at our rental properties, and we found reasonably priced models that make our tenants really happy. If you'd like to hear more personal stories, from your East Bay neighbors and their journeys towards decarbonizing their homes, check out, check out East Bay Green Homes Tour. You can watch a recording of the event from last May. You can sign up for future events. Uh, you can check out the archive of recordings from previous years. Our home is featured in the 2022 archive. And you can hopefully find a good idea that is similar to, to your own home and, uh, and troubleshoot for your situation. So challenge number four could be your electric panel. Now, we personally also haven't had this situation, but it's a concern that, that often comes up. Are you going to have to upgrade your electric panel to handle the additional electrical load? And, you know, that can be really expensive. So maybe you might, but again, pre-planning can make a huge difference in making this transition easier and more affordable. Despite conventional thinking, it is actually possible to increase your electric use without having to upgrade the panel. If this is something that is of interest to you, of you, interest to you, then please try out the Watt Diet Calculator at Redwood Energy. They have a free program that will give you a personalized plan to electrify without having to upgrade the panel. And remember that electric panel load design is architected for everything to be on at once and ensure uninterrupted power, but rarely do you run everything simultaneously. In addition, most houses are designed to run incandescent light bulbs and energy intensive appliances. But as technology has improved and loads required for those outlets and switches have come down, uh, but your electrical wiring and circuits have not, uh, you, can, you can usually solve this issue with a little bit of creativity and understanding of where your electrical loads are. Challenge number five is grid reliability. This is actually a two-part concern. So the first part is, is about whether or not the grid can handle everyone going all electric. And honestly, if everyone transitioned to clean energy right now, today, it would be too much for the grid. But despite, despite the fact that things are happening quickly, they're not happening all at once. And it's a transition and PG&E is part of the transition. They are actively working towards an all electric future and keeping ahead with their changes. So don't let this concern, this, this concern keep you from taking advantage of the savings that are available right now to make your home healthier and less polluting. 
And also note that the heavy deployment of home solar systems in our area area has helped to strengthen the grid for everyone. And that work is also continuing. The other concern about grid reliability is outages. Outages can make us feel more vulnerable and some people feel less at risk by having a second energy option. And I get that. But the truth is that most modern gas appliances use electric ignition. And unfortunately, they're not gonna work during an outage the way the older gas appliances did. On the other hand, there are some really cool electrical appliances that include features to help you weather through an outage. For example, you can bank extra hot water with your heat pump water heater to carry you through an outage. Or here's an induction range made by the Bay Area company Channing Street Copper that includes a built-in battery that allows you to continue using it during an outage. Amazingly, this range requires only 100 volts. And get this, their chief scientist, Steve Kalish, says that this is just the beginning of introducing battery storage into our common appliances. Think about that if they could add a battery to your freezer. And you know, our electric rates are generally more expensive at dinner time, right when we want to use our cooking appliances. But for everyday use, this battery is designed to charge when rates are cheap. So you can pay less for that energy no matter when you use it. Of course, we're not quite there with battery backup in all appliances, but we do have some other pretty cool solutions. We now have solar panels with sunlight backup systems, which don't require an additional battery for storage. And one of my favorite solutions, since I have an older solar system on my house without a battery system, is vehicle to house charging, also known as bi-directional charging, offered in some electric car models. Electric car batteries can hold 10 times or more power than a typical house battery. So this feature seems like a no-brainer. This transition is happening really fast and can seem overwhelming, but there are some amazing resources and most of them are free. Here are a couple of really good places to get more detailed information. Redwood Energy has a very detailed pocketbook publication that addresses everything, even your fireplace, your gr grill, and your pool heater. And that's where you'll find the Watt Diet Calculator that I mentioned earlier. Rewiring America, another, another site, is a national site that offers comprehensive information for all stakeholders, including contractors and cities and towns. They also offer useful planning charts to help you ma map out an overall electrification plan based on your personal priority, whether that's uh, trying to transition as quickly as possible, or maybe it's trying to do it as, as uh, a, in the most affordable way. Switches on Bay Ren and Quick Carbon are all free sources for helping you find vetted contractors, rebates, and expert advisors. And did you know that you can borrow a free induction cooktop from PG&E? They'll mail it to you for your convenience, and it comes with a pan and everything. It's a nice way to dip your toe into induction cooking if you're not quite there yet. And if you are in the East Bay Community Energy District, they also have a free cooktop loaner program, as does the city of Lafayette, and Lafayette also has a free electric uh, leaf blower uh, loaner program. So that's the end of my presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, and we're going to get to as many as we can at the end of the presentations. But before we go to our next presenter, I'd like you to, to sign up for our additional webinars this week. On Wednesday, we have a presentation on, on climate change solutions and advocacy, so how you might work with other members in your community to address climate change. And on Thursday, we're going to be looking at what is a carbon sink. So uh, please use the QR code and, and sign up if, if either of those are of interest to you. And now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Cooper Marcus with Quick Carbon. Quick Carbon is a free local service that helps you replace your home's fossil gas appliances with clean electric alternatives like heat pumps and induction stoves. Quick Carbon will assess your home and prepare a customized quitting plan. And then they'll help you work with great contractors and get electrification done right with maximum rebates. Thank you so much for joining us, Cooper. All right, thank you, Brenna. Wow, great presentation. Uh, I hope I still have things left to cover. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Uh, let's see, let me just get my screen sharing up. 
Sorry, just a moment. Okay, here we go. Great, <clears throat> should be able to see my screen. I'm keeping an eye on the chat as well and happy to entertain questions as we go. Um, so uh, let's see, there's a lot of different things I cover, but let me let me whip through a few things here. Uh, hopefully this is helpful and inspiring. And I, I think my main goal here is uh, to try to inspire you, right? Um, we can do this. Uh, we can electrify our homes. We can address the feelings that I'm sure many of us feel around, um, uh, gosh, whether it's nervousness or disempowerment uh, or just uncertainty about how to address the climate crisis, uh, we can have more comfortable, safer homes that are more valuable and are eventually at least cheaper to operate. Um, and we can do this all for remarkably low cost, right? This world of home electrification is just at an incredible place right now. Um, probably very different than what you thought of as an electrified home of the past, right? We've seen stoves glowing red hot and uh, we used to heat some homes with that same resistance technology as well. Uh, that's not what we're talking about anymore. Just as folks are discovering that electric cars, modern electric cars are better in basically every way than modern gas cars. They're more comfortable, they're quieter, they're more performant, they're cheaper to own and operate. Uh, they seem to perhaps last longer. Um, just like people are discovering that about electric cars, we're now starting to discover that electric homes are also better uh, and nothing like uh, those of the past. Now, part of the uh, joy we're sharing here today comes from the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Happy birthday. Uh, it was a few weeks ago, but we're now a year on uh, from when the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Uh, and the amount of money and support it's bringing into this market uh, is just tremendous. Uh, but luckily, even before all of these Inflation Reduction Act rebates and incentives are available, and indeed, most of them are not yet available. There are tax credits, but not yet some of the rebates. Local, uh, at the state and the regional, uh, and even down at the city level, incentives are huge. Uh, and some of the choices we're talking about making in terms of upgrading your home off of fossil fuels uh, are um, almost completely paid for uh, by rebates and incentives, uh, which is really just a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of support. Uh, and maybe maybe, um, yeah, is a great reason to proceed. Another great reason to proceed with electrifying your home, with starting to electrify, is that transitioning our homes from fossil fuel, from so-called natural gas to clean electric appliances is for most of us, the single largest choice, the number one way we act against climate change. You know, there's small choices that can add up over time, like choosing to ride your bike instead of driving your car or choosing to eat a vegetarian meal instead of a meat-based meal. But those are choices that you have to keep making. The amazing thing about electrifying your home is that you make a choice once. One time you choose to switch from a gas water heater to an electric water heater and the benefits in terms of the climate uh, harm reduction that you've just produced are massive. Uh, it may be the single largest source of your climate impact for most people is their homes. Uh, and by moving your appliances from fossil fuel uh, to electric. Um, this, uh oh, sorry, can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Um, this chart uh, is from San Francisco, but it's pretty similar for other areas around the, the Bay Area and really around Northern California. We can see that from our uh, our uh, lifestyle that 40% uh, of greenhouse gas is coming from operating buildings. But I want to call your attention to this tiny little 3% slice. A lot of folks think that most 
of the impact is coming from our power, right? That our electricity must be generated by fossil fuel. Well, amazingly not. <laughs> We've made great progress as a society reducing the fossil fuel uh, combustion in generating electricity. And most of the impact now comes from burning fossil fuel in our buildings. Of course, the other big chunk comes from transportation. Uh, but you can tackle both of these and electrifying your car. Now, within our home, uh, in California, typically the majority of climate impact is coming from our water heaters. These little machines sitting in a closet, just doing their thing, are producing a big climate impact. Uh, and in a way, this is sort of a relief because addressing this part of your home's climate impact is one of the cheapest and easiest things to do. Uh, and I see a question from Laura about when do we anticipate rebates will be available? Um, and uh, I think she's referring to the Inflation Reduction Act rebates and, and what will happen to state and local rebates. Um, so there are big rebates available today. And what's likely to happen is that as new rebates come on the market, old rebates will be reduced or adjusted. We may be at peak rebate uh, right now. Um, we don't think that for most aspects of home electrification, we're going to see much bigger rebates in the future. Uh, we've already seen this happen in the past. When new rebate programs have started, others will tend to reduce their support. Um, so uh, what will be available for heat pumps in a year? It's probably going to be similar to what's available today. It can vary, though, notably for folks with low or moderate incomes. Uh, and doing the analysis is important, but also difficult uh, and something that, that we do here at Quick Carbon. So let me whip through a few more slides. Um, we've covered a little bit the health impacts of burning fossil fuel inside your home. Gas stoves are a real source of uh, uh, danger to occupants in homes. Uh, there's new research just came out how gas stoves are addressing or impacting learning uh, in um, youth, in kids, uh, not just their chances of getting asthma. Um, and as I mentioned before, gas appliances are really the source of much of our climate impact and also our local climate impact. Did you know, for example, that the gas appliances in our homes and buildings, they're generating more NOx, that's nitrogen oxides. Uh, these are um, uh, the, the dangerous compounds that can uh, corrode your teeth and cause smog. That's more of that is coming from our appliances than our cars. Again, this is a bit of a mind blowing fact, but our cars are cleaned up a lot due to federal uh, and state requirements. Cars are really quite clean, gas burning cars, but our home appliances haven't cleaned up at all. Uh, and they really can't. Uh, if you want to clean up your home appliances, they must be electrified. Uh, Jackie was asking about this slice of where uh, the gas is going in a home, and if this changes much in different regions. So yes, this chart is a lot different in places where it's much colder, like the upper Midwest, or much warmer, like the desert Southwest. But in coastal and near coastal California, even up into Oregon and Washington coastal areas, this chart is fairly similar. For almost all homes, Space heating and water heating together are the vast majority of gas usage and everything else is a small slice. Okay, when you own a home, uh, and I'm talking now mostly about homeowners, though this also applies to landlords who own rental properties, you become responsible for its appliances, right? The appliances are part of the home uh, and uh, in the past, we would just buy new gas appliances to replace our old gas appliances. Well, now we are electrifying, and this is our tremendous opportunity and also our challenge as a society. It's that 67 million homes are going to get upgraded from gas to electric appliances for climate, for safety, for health, uh, and for savings, um, starting uh, next, hopefully, with your home. And when we think about these electrification, I hope you can put aside your past conception, perhaps, that this is expensive, right? Electric appliances can be cheaper. They can be cheaper to buy 
and to operate, and especially if you do the math right and consider non-monetary benefits, right? What is it worth knowing that when you take a shower, you're not contributing to climate change? It's worth something. For some of us, it's worth a lot. Uh, this is especially true of heat pump water heaters, the things that will replace your gas water heater, and especially true while rebates are large uh, like they are right now. So let me see if I can pick up the pace a little bit here. So what are we talking about here? Well, we're mostly talking about water heating, space heating, clothes drying, cooking, and your electric vehicle, plus buying renewable energy. So for heating, we're talking about going from a gas furnace to a heat pump. And for water heating, same, going from a gas water heater to a heat pump water heater. In your, in your kitchen, you'll move from a gas stove to an induction stove. And there's your dryer and your pool heater. There's tremendous uh, heat pumps that can he uh, heat a pool and even cool it when it's really hot out. We've seen the electric fireplaces and EV chargers. Do you want to take a moment to mention solar and batteries? They don't really represent decarbonization. Solar and batteries can be useful for reducing your utility bills, but they will do nearly nothing to reduce your climate impact. And the reason is that we can see this tiny little slice of our climate impact coming from electricity. Well, imagine if everybody had enough solar and batteries to power their homes. Well, then that 3% slice would go to zero. But that 35% slice where we're burning natural gas in our buildings, it wouldn't have changed at all. So you could see that everybody getting solar and batteries, eh, it would be nice, but it's not gonna make a difference to the climate. I see a couple questions here. Ole is asking about a gas dryer and a, a gas line connecting it. Um, no, there's nothing you need to do except hopefully electrify that dryer. Kathleen's mentioning an on-demand water heater. Probably that's a gas on-demand water heater. And it's just as bad for the climate uh, and just as terrific of an opportunity to electrify as a gas tank water heater. If it's an electric on-demand water heater, well, you have a tremendous opportunity to save on your utility bills by electrifying it. Okay, so what does electrification really mean? Well, it means making a plan and then making an upgrade and then repeating the process. It's really important to start with a plan so you know where all this is going and so that all the different electric appliances that are gonna be coming into your home fit well together, maximize your rebates and incentives. But once you have a plan, then it's a good idea to start following it. And this really does mean getting in touch with a contractor and making a purchase, right? That is what an upgrade is, is a purchase of a new appliance. Of course, it's gonna come with lots of rebates and incentives, and so it can be remarkably cheap. And then you do it again, right? For most folks, this journey is going to take years, and that's okay, uh, right? Uh, it, you do it at your pace, uh, but it starting with that plan and starting with a purchase is terrific. Now, I grew up in a household where my mother, uh, she grew up uh, in uh, England in World War II, and she learned to use up everything. And I learned that as a child, but I've had to learn a new thing when it comes to thinking about electrifying our home which is that keeping our gas appliances around uh, is harmful. We don't actually want to use up our gas appliances, just like we would not say, well, let's use up that uh, defective or harmful uh, piece of equipment or uh, food or whatever it is that's out there in the market. If something is bad, it's better to get rid of it than to use it up. Gas appliances fall into this group. And when you do replace them with a heat pump, lucky you, that gas appliance is gonna to go to the recycling yard and get turned into a, a new appliance, a heat pump, a new heat pump. It doesn't go to the landfill. I wanna make one more point here about doing this early. You can electrify at your own pace, but the timing really matters. And if you care about society moving forward, towards a cleaner, safer, healthier future for everybody, then choosing to electrify sooner is much better because these early purchases develop the market, right? We heard about what's coming from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Uh, that's more likely to occur 
folks are more likely to be encouraged to electrify their homes if people are already doing it. And by people, I mean you. <laughs> if we are already doing it, if we are making these purchases, if we are doing these upgrades in our home, it makes it easier and better for those who follow in our footsteps. And perhaps most importantly, it allows us to be out there telling the story. I electrified, it was great. That is the number one way that more electrification happens is that we're out there telling our friends and neighbors how much we enjoyed it, how happy we are. So the old fashioned way is thinking about this as we're having to pay a lot, we're having to sacrifice. The new reality is that we can get paid to electrify and we benefit by fighting climate change. Okay, I'm Cooper, I'm from Quick Carbon and we offer a free service funded by the US Department of Energy and by our partnership with contractors to help you through the process of electrifying. First, we're gonna make a plan that's specific to your home and your situation. Then we're gonna coach you and motivate you to think about electrifying. When you're ready at your timing, we'll get you connected with a contractor and we'll make sure that they've given you a great bid for the right scope of work. We'll help ensure that all the rebates and incentives are as big and as easy as possible. And then when you're ready, we'll do it again and electrify another part of your home, help you electrify another part until we've got a party. This is uh, the best I could find of an AI generated image of a pinata, a gas meter pinata. We'll hang that up in the tree and celebrate. Just uh, to give you a sense of where we're coming from in terms of support, we've won two different prizes from the US Department of Energy. Quick Carbon has been awarded these prizes. We're a member of the Net Zero Accelerator being run by the US Green Building Council. I serve on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's Implementation Working Group. Uh, and we work with numerous Department of Energy national labs, including Lawrence Berkeley Lab and the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. They all support our work. Uh, and so I hope you start by starting. And this is my last slide, right? Where do you start? Well, with a free plan and with advice, hopefully from us, but you could, there's also other providers uh, that were mentioned earlier, like Switches On and Bay Ren, and then with an upgrade electrify something, even if it's just that little induction cooktop, that plug-in induction cooktop in your kitchen, right? You could borrow one for free. You could buy one at Ikea or on Amazon, typically for less than $70. Start by starting. Do something that reduces your combustion of fossil fuel and gets you started on the electrification journey. And then hopefully you keep going, but it sure is easier to proceed once you've started. And most importantly, by sharing your voice. Talk with your family, talk with your friends and your neighbors, with your politicians, and tell them how important it is and how much joy you're getting from moving your home and your life off of fossil fuels and onto clean, safe electricity. Okay, that's what I've got to share with you today. I'm happy to take questions or Brianna, uh, Brenna, sorry, how would you like to proceed here? Well, uh, I think you answered the questions that were in the chat. Um, do we have any additional questions? I see Laura there asking, uh, did you say the two most impactful answer actions are replacing our water heater uh, and our furnace? Um, so yes, uh, for most homes and most families, if we're talking about what you can do within your home, electrifying your space heating and your water heating are by far the largest sources of climate impact. However, some families that Quick Carbon works with, they care more about their stove, right? It's a small slice of the climate impact, but it's a big impact on indoor air quality. When you get a heat pump water heater, it's not going to change your indoor air quality, at least it shouldn't, right? Your air quality should not be affected by your gas water heater, but it will make a big difference to uh, the air quality that surrounds your family and your pets and your kids. Um, so um, let's see, Laura's asking about some, uh, some price ranges. Um, maybe Brenna, you have, I want to get, uh, I have a slide here that summarizes some I just pricing. Put, um, 
So Laura, you were asking about current incentives. So I just put the um, link in the chat to switcheson.org. So the incentives can depend on where you're located. They can, they can be income dependent. So there can be different things. There is something for everyone. So if you go to switches on, just put in your zip code and it's going to tell you all of the applicable um, rebates that are and incentives that are available to you. And um, if you're looking at a particular appliance, you can look for just that appliance, or you can get a list of incentives and kind of choose what looks like something you want to tackle. So um, that's the best place to go and look for that. Now, when Quit Carbon makes you a home electrification plan, we'll also figure out all of the incentives that are specific to your situation because they vary by home, by the equipment that's being replaced and the equipment you're purchasing, by your family situation. There's lots of it depends. Uh, and we work out all of those for you. Um, here's an example of what a water heater now, this is an example of electrifying a water heater. So maybe we start out, it's not unusual to see an estimate as much as $10,000. And uh, then we freak out right then, right? Well, holy cow, that sounds like a lot. But wait, there's $7,700 in rebates. So now we're talking about spending $2,300. That sounds a lot better. But hold on, Quick Carbon will run the utility bill projections for you. And what we discovered in this situation, which is quite typical, that over the next 15 years, you're gonna save $2,500 on your utility bill. Well, the result here is that you got paid $200 to electrify your water heater. Remember before when I said it's important to shift that framing, the way you're thinking about this from putting on a cardigan and sacrificing and spending a lot to do the right thing? Well, look at this. You just got paid $200 uh, to electrify your water heat, to have a heat pump water heater. Uh, and you can compare that for what might be a contractor bid to put in a gas water heater, which could be in the range of two to $4,000 or more. So this isn't more expensive than gas. This is radically cheaper. And in fact, you're getting paid in this case, to make the change. Now for electrifying your space heating, for doing a heat pump that's going to heat and cool your home, there is more of an out-of-pocket expense. The top line cost is higher and the rebates are not as big of a fraction of the, uh, the expense. But when you compare it to the cost, a heat pump for your home heating and cooling, compared to the cost of a new gas furnace and a new air conditioner, because a heat pump will heat and cool, typically it's cheaper. Heat pumps are cheaper. So we're still, when we do the math right, when we compare things correctly, we're still talking about getting paid or having it be cheaper to electrify than to stay with fossil fuels. Okay, let's see. I see a question about mini splits. Uh, I've got some pictures. Um, so Brenna, you did a great job of explaining kind of how a heat pump works at the physics level, I guess. <laughs> it moves heat. Um, so uh, Kathy, um, outside your home, when you have a mini split, uh, there will be a machine like this uh, here in the picture here. I, I'm sorry, if these slides, I'm just trying to use the pictures. Um, this will extract heat from the air around your home. And then I don't actually know if I have a picture of the part that's inside your home, uh, but there will be a piece inside your home that's going to put uh, the warmth into your home uh, or the cooling into your home. Um, and how does it work? Well, <laughs> uh, it kind of works like magic. Um, I guess it works like your, your fridge running in reverse. Uh, your fridge is a heat pump. Everybody already has a heat pump. Uh, it pumps heat from inside your fridge. It removes the heat and it moves it into basically into your kitchen, right? You felt how it's kind of warm above your fridge. Uh, that's the heat getting moved. Uh, so a heat pump, a mini split heat pump uh, is uh, a bigger machine that's working in the other direction. It's taking heat that exists outside your home in the air around you and moving it inside your house. Uh, they're magical machines uh, and they work even when it seems 
cold outside, uh, there is still a lot of heat energy in the air outside your home, even when it's well below freezing. Yeah, and I can share a picture of that. Oh, uh, great. Thank you. So hopefully you all can see this slide mm. picture in the upper left shows what, what the mini split looks like. And so as Cooper said, the technology is the same. It's just how it's coming into your house. So with a, if you're using many splits, you're going to have one in each room that you want to um, condition the air for. Um, and also we, so we used our vent, our, our current vent system. So ours is just, I mean, if you come into my house, you're not going to know that, that I am using a heat pump instead, because it looks the same. But um, the point is just that there's different ways to do it. And in fact, we um, had one situation at one of the rentals where we use same thing. It's a heat pump, but we put a cassette in the ceiling because it just worked best for that space. So the point is there's a lot of really great solutions based on, on what your situation is and, and what you want to do. So for us, part of why we used our vented system was because our vents were in really good condition. If that's not the case, you can avoid having to, to deal with that um, by, by using mini splits. Great answer, Brenna. And I wish I had a photo handy, but um, there's even a form of a mini split where it looks like you have a picture hanging on your wall, a photograph or a painting. And in fact, warm or cool air is coming out from behind the picture into your room. Uh, it's incredible. Um, so you don't have to imagine that you need to have a box up high on the wall. There are many different options that fit all sorts of home designs uh, and standards for what you see inside your house. Okay, so. I've... Oh, go ahead, Brenna. Uh, do many splits also reduce elect? Yes, they do reduce your electricity expense because they're also using heat pump technology. So think about it this way: you can have a French style refrigerator. You can have, a, a, you know, where it's the, the two doors side by side. There's all kinds of different configurations, but the technology uh, of cooling your food is the same, and it's the same with whether you're using. Um, a ductless uh, system or using your current ducts or using mini splits or a cassette, they're all using a heat pump. And so it's going to reduce your electricity costs. And for mini splits, so you're, you're saying you don't need to turn it on in the bedrooms if you're not there. That's true with mini splits. With the vented system, it's going to be the same as, as your gas system. It is going to heat and cool the whole house, but it still uses a lot less ele electricity than the gas system. And so you, yes, you save money. Um, there's just a few questions coming through that are quite specific, like Ole's asking about uh, what gauge or what amperage of wire. Um, and Jackie had asked about particular pricing breakdown for furnace or heat pump replacement. Um, we're getting in, in some of these questions into things that are very specific and can vary quite a bit by home, uh, by equipment, by manufacturer. Oh, we can't hear you, Cooper. Hear you, Cooper. Oh, shoot. I'm happy. There you are. Am I back now? Yeah. Great. Okay. Part of the reason why Quick Carbon came into existence is that me and my colleagues um, were uh, frustrated by the lack of specificity. We could learn in general about what we needed and what we were going to do to to electrify our own homes, but we couldn't uh, figure out sort of specifically well what rebates for me and what heat pump do I need and how will my bills change? Uh, and so we figured out a way to. Um, have there be a service? This analysis, uh, this, this, these answers specifically for each one of our homeowner clients. And we would love to uh, help each of you come on over to quickcarbon.com uh, and try it out. Uh, our service is free and easy and no obligation. Uh, you can get a plan and then decide what you want to do with it. Um, Anne is asking about the weight for rebates after installation. Well, it also depends. Unfortunately, some rebates right now can take some months to arrive, but others are available within weeks and some of them are instant. Uh, they're at the time of purchase. Uh, and making sure that 
you are clear on your rebate timing, what you need, and that your contractor is also clear on it uh, is an important part of having this work go smoothly. Yeah, and just again, um, Anne, if you go to Switches On and you look at the list of incentives, it will tell you whether whether it's available immediately when you purchase it or whether it's something that your contractor has to apply for so you can get an idea of how soon the incentive is available. So I think also um, 350 is hoping that all of you will take our survey. And um, let me see, I think I think it was put in the chat earlier. Maybe we can put that in the chat again and um, let us know um, your how you feel about climate change. And if you are interested in signing up for our newsletter, please do so. Um, but before we break, I just see one more, more question. So Patrick is asking about the difference between 120 and 200 water heaters. Um, and so, the 120 volt water heater is is newer and hopefully it makes it easier for more people to use a water heater. I think as long as you don't need um, you know a lot of of hot water, most people can use the 120 volts successfully. Okay, and Lisa also put a sign up link for our newsletter. And um, if you're interested in volunteering or joining with us. And lastly, I just wanna remind everyone that we have two more webinars. We have one coming up on Wednesday and another on Thursday. At Wednesday's webinar, we're gonna um, talk about uh, community, uh, working with our communities to address climate change. And on Thursday, we're going to talk about carbon sinks. Um, Looks like there might be a couple more questions here. Okay, Marcia, do, do you have a question? Yes, unfortunately, as soon as the webinar started, I got an important phone call and I had to, I kind of missed the whole thing, but I understand I'm going to be receiving a recording of this. I do believe that the library records them. I'm not sure if they send them out or if they make it available on their website. Um, is it yes, we record it and then we will post it to our YouTube channel and everybody who registers for these three programs will get an email with that link. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. I didn't want to miss it, but <laughs> it was one of those important health calls. So. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us. And um, hope to see you on Wednesday. Thank you.